It's time to review our assumptions. We've gone over, if you can believe it, each and every one of these, uh, to more or less their complete extent. We're going to be spending a lot more time on exchangeability in the future, but the rest of these I feel pretty comfortable with. So let's go over them and their potential solutions. Positivity. So positivity basically means that you've got all of your treatment values and all of your segments of the population. This is extremely important when you're dealing with conditional exchangeability, when you might need to go all the way down to um, dog owners in Illinois that are left-handed. If you don't have positivity, simple things that you can do would be go ahead and expand the populations that you're looking at. So expand those segments and or get more people surveyed. So survey more people, include more people in your experiment. The stable unit treatment value assumption is actually two assumptions, if we remember. Uh, one is the no interference, uh, no interference. And then the second one is the consistency, consistency. The no interference assumption is the assumption that your subjects won't be interfering with each other, that one treatment value assigned to one subject won't affect the outcome of another subject. If you believe this is happening in your experiments, uh, I would suggest, I, I'll go ahead and include some links down below, and I'd suggest that you uh, read a little bit on some uh, advanced techniques in order to deal with this. It's going to be a little bit outside the scope of the class materials this time. Consistency, on the other hand, you will definitely need. Having a well-defined treatment is uh, of critical importance. If you don't have a well-defined treatment, then you don't necessarily have a well-defined study. Uh, you can't do causal inference, so this one is paramount. Large sample size. Large sample size has two parts to it as well. It has the uh, uh, it has the sample variability. So sample variability. Uh, so this is one of the things large sample size protects you against. And it also has the non-deterministic causal effects. So I'm just going to write this as non-deterministic causal effects. So again, if you know that you're going to have high sample variability because the population is very varied or if you have non-deterministic causal effects that are very varied, in this case going to a casino, um, you're going to go ahead and need a larger sample size to get better confidence intervals on the values of interest. Uh, if you don't have a large enough sample size, there are techniques to get tighter confidence intervals. Uh, again, they're a little bit outside the scope of this class. Um, or you can make more assumptions that will allow you to get by. That being said, the simple solution for a large sample size, not having this, is sample more people. Uh, double-blinded. So the double-blinded situation, remember we had two effects if you were not double-blinded. Uh, you had the placebo effect. Uh, let me go ahead and write these both down. You have the placebo effect. So placebo. And you also had the scientist preference effect. So scientist preference effect. Just preference effect. So if you weren't double-blinded, you would have these two effects that would also go along with the actual causal effect. And perhaps there might not be any actual causal effect, but you'd get an effect from scientist preference and placebo. And so this might uh, induce you into thinking that there is a causal effect. If you cannot double-blind, so one, if you are conducting the experiment yourself, always double-blind. Uh, two, if you cannot double-blind, you're dealing with observational studies. We'll talk about some potential cures for this later on. Um, the, attention, the intention to treat uh, cure for this is, is one of the, the more important ones. And as well, you just will need to note in your analysis that yes, this could be because of placebo uh, or scientist preference. There are some advanced techniques to deal with this if you're able to get different types of samples. So samples where you just treat under the placebo uh, or samples where the scientists don't know. Uh, and then you're able to actually correct for this error. Uh, but I'm going to assume that you don't have those. And I might include some links down below. No measurement error. Uh, this is a this is a truly massive uh, realm of um, uh, causal inference here. Uh, there, there's a ton of stuff dealing with how to deal with measurement error. Um, that being said, uh, this doesn't bother me as much because many uh, so any experiment that you're dealing with, you you won't necessarily have measurement error. You should design your experiment so that you don't have measurement error. So for example, in A/B tests and modern experiments, if you're if you're just sort of a data scientist at a tech company. Uh, you're never going to have this measurement error effect. Um, this happens much more frequently in observational studies, 
Um, and in those cases, I would again, I would suggest that you, uh, I would, I would refer you to sort of uh, more advanced materials here. So this is sort of like the, the sort of basics, and, and a lot of these, I, I know I'm sort of saying, hey, you know, if there's if there's interference, you know, go go get more. Uh, you know, this is an advanced topic. You know, don't you need to look elsewhere outside of this class if you want to. Uh, you know, deal with small sample sizes, you know, bootstrapping might not necessarily be the best technique for you. Instead, you might need to use something that has a higher order confidence interval. So in that case, you know, again, I refer you to different stuff. If you're interested in, in learning about doing bootstrap calibration or something like that, which is a very simple um, way to deal with a smaller sample size, uh, you can check out this link above. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and include this as well from my bootstrapping series. Double blindedness. Yes, once again, there, there are techniques to do this. They're not super complex. I might actually include some of these at the end of the results, but they are very specific. So they're very specific to each type of study that you're doing. And then finally, no measurement error. The no measurement error, uh, I'm just gonna uh, completely wave my hands at. Uh, I'm not actually a big expert in, in dealing with measurement error. Um, that being said, I, I will try to find some links to point you to good materials if you are interested in learning how to correct for measurement error in observational studies. And then finally, we have exchangeability. Um, and exchangeability comes in two forms. It comes in marginal exchangeability. Uh, marginal exchangeability is the exchangeability we talked about initially. This is the exchangeability in the entire population. And conditional exchangeability. Conditional exchangeability. Uh, we learned that we can use conditional exchangeability if randomization is necessarily, you know, quote unquote, immoral or it doesn't doesn't necessarily make practical sense. So conditional exchangeability, we can actually even get at the average causal effect using standardization. Uh, so this is really nice. Uh, exchangeability, though, is probably one of the most important assumptions we have here, and it's the one we're going to be spending the most time after this. So we're going to be talking about expanding exchangeability assumptions. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to uh, prove exchangeability in observational studies. Uh, so the next couple of, probably the next majority of, of lecture videos, probably around 10, are going to be dealing with exchangeability, its effects, and lots of different uh, exceptions to the exchangeability rule. Okay, so these are the assumptions. Uh, we, we've pretty much covered uh, these ones up here. We'll be doing a little bit more with positivity later on, and we'll be doing a lot more with exchangeability.